All right, uh, welcome everyone uh, to this talk with such a long title, um, but it is Friday, so maybe thing, uh, I think everything goes on Fridays. Um, so uh, today I will talk about two wonderful techniques uh, for planning products and releases. Uh, these two, te two techniques are uh, impact mapping and story mapping. And um, I like to say that these two techniques will help you to create or to plan uh, successful products. So it would be good for us to start defining what a successful product is. So um, I don't have a definition. It's more like when I see one, I know that is one. Um, but this chart can give us an idea of what a successful product is. Uh, so these are the top five best global brands uh, as of 2018, and and you can see um, that maybe the the technology is winning at the battle. Um, so uh, somebody said at some point the software is eating the world. Um, so if we look at this uh, five uh, brands, and maybe we can focus on the top four because those are the ones that are. Um, closer to what we do, um, we might say that they have produced some products that we feel um, are successful products. They have changed the way we do things. So Amazon, for example, has changed the way we shop on the internet. So it influences that much. Uh, Google, you know, the way we search for information also, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, so many people using uh, GPS anymore after you have Google Maps and same thing with Apple, all the products, the phone products. Uh, so these are, I will say, uh, some examples of a successful product. Uh, you may have products that you use every day uh, that you may feel uh, they are very successful. That, so I don't know what criteria you use to say this is a successful product. Usually it has to be something um, that I would say impresses you the way they do uh, deliver features to you and how valuable those features are and for how long they have been doing that. So there should be some consistency as well. Now, what is the, what is the context for this talk? We may need to talk about, well, um, what is the space in which we're going to be uh, trying to apply or so use these techniques? Um, so I guess at this point, uh, most people are doing some form of agile software development and trying to be agile, trying to deliver uh, software faster, valuable software faster. Um, so agile software development, we know there are four values, 12 principles, and uh, I want to pay attention to these three principles. Um, I think they're very relevant to what we're going to be covering here. Uh, so the first one, this is the top um, the number one principle in agile product, uh, agile development is our highest priority is to satisfy customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. So that suggests that we should, first of all, define what valuable software is. We can say, well, those successful products we're talking about. And in terms of early and continuous, uh, it suggests that we need to think about small um, I'll say releases, short releases. We cannot keep trying to have releases that will take a year or three years. So we have to go faster than that. The other thing we have here is changing requirements. And the reason um, why we're considering this is because that's the nature of software. This is one of the things that we can say is true in every software project. Requirements will change. So we need to plan uh, taking all of that into consideration. So, and that suggests also that maybe we cannot plan too far ahead because requirements will, requirements will change. So what would be the point of planning too far out too much when we know that all the things we're gonna be working may change priorities or we need to um, introduce new features, drop some features. So it would be better for us to start planning on, on a shorter cadence. And, and that would be also critical. Uh, finally, we have simplicity, uh, which is the art of maximizing amount of work not done. Um, some people may say, well, that's like being lazy. Well, if you like. Um, so one of the things that we have seen uh, on the industry is the what we say is a feature factory uh, in, you know, some 
uh, organization will take the approach producing features, features, features without actually validating if those features are valuable for the user. Um, and I guess you use everyday software in which you're using maybe 10% uh, of all the capabilities the software product uh, produces. Um, so uh, extra features is one of the worst kind of waste because we start assuming that we need all that and we make the investment and then that essentially it will uh, affect um, our delivery. We will not be able to sustain, we will not be able to keep the customer happy. So maybe it's, it's a good moment for us to talk about value streams since we want to deliver valuable software frequently. Um, how are we gonna measure how frequent we can do it? So by measuring uh, lead time, which is the amount of time it takes from a request or from a requirement or from an idea until it's delivered, if you can have an average, how long does it take typically to release something that your customer is asking? That's essentially what we call lead time. And if you think in terms of, let's say, Scrum, so in Scrum, the approach we use is to have uh, sprints and we can have several sprints within the release. All the time that we have been spending and building those features sprint by sprint, the lead time keep increasing unless that we are actually putting those features on the hands of the customer so that you can start gaining that value, right? So the more we batch, the longer that this um, value stream and this lead time will take. And also it's important to recognize uh, the difference between lead time and processing time. Some people use cycle time for that, but it's overloaded, so I, I'm avoiding using uh, cycle time here. So uh, processing time is the amount of time we spend working on the request. So the gap or the difference between lead time and processing time, uh, it will give you some insight about how much waste you're carrying. It could be because we're producing um, or trying to produce too many features or we have some other forms of waste or inefficiencies in our process. So our aim here is to find a way how to shrink this uh, value stream. And we, first of all, would like to identify what is the minimum that we can release so that we can have valuable software uh, continuously so that we can satisfy that um, agile principle. So I wanna talk about uh, focusing on outcomes and instead of features uh, so that you can get away from the um, feature factory and focus more on impact. And if you remember the examples that I used for successful products, the Apple, the Amazon, and, and so on and so forth, I think they have produced impact in the way we do things. So they are produce outcomes, not just features. So we need to make sure that we focus on that because as you can see in this quote, that is not so useless as doing efficiently something that we shouldn't be doing at all. So you can have the perfect process, you may have your, a uh, perfect, I would say, uh, deployment pipeline and, and uh, all the automation and everything. But if all the stuff you're building is not carrying a huge amount of value, it doesn't matter. So at the end, you may have cases, and I've seen this, you know, myself, like every day we have our, um, let's say, phone app saying, well, here's a new update, here's a new update. They're going frequently, they're the releasing features and features, but sometimes you feel like, I mean, I haven't even seen the previous feature from the previous release. Um, so it's it started getting, in some cases, even annoying. Uh, so, but if it's producing outcomes, then we'll definitely would like to take a look and, and, and take advantage of it. Now, this is something that I do on my uh, classes when I do either, you know, release um, planning or let's say agile requirements classes. Uh, I like to ask people this uh, question is, is essentially, how would you rank your organization in terms of delivering outcomes or how focused we are for delivering outcomes? So the first one is people know why they are doing their work. Um, so the more we know the why, the more willing that we're gonna be to help in the better we're gonna fit into the picture and make sure that anything that we're doing is to satisfy that why. But when that why isn't clear, 
you might be even, you know, jeopardizing all the plans without knowing because I didn't know. I was I thought that this will be good. And and you will be surprised how often we go to organizations that they don't have a clear why, even for something like why are you adopting Agile? Why are you adopting Scrum? So it's 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 very, very common that they haven't talked about that sufficiently. They just wanna have their team using what everybody's using, in this case, Scrum. The next one here is the team is uh, focused on delivering outcomes and impacts uh, rather than features. Um, so if we identify what is the impact that we want to produce, in some cases you will realize, well, we don't even need to build that feature. Maybe we can have find a, I would say, a less expensive way for us to produce that impact on the user. Uh, next is feedback. Obviously, very important to get feedback, um, in this case, from the people using the work we're producing so that we can uh, make better decisions about do we need to keep adding more features on this or this is not providing the value we want so uh, so that we can focus on something that definitely will help. And uh, finally, everybody cares. So if we have, uh, as I mentioned, a good understanding of the why, then we're going to have uh, more people involved and everybody will care about the product we're producing. So uh, this is kind of a statement about getting great results and this is very connected to um, our talk on uh, impact mapping. So understanding the why, who we're gonna be impacting, uh, what is the impact we want to produce, and then finally, just after we do all that, it's gonna, gonna be looking at, oh, what feature can we deliver? What capability? can we deliver that will produce that value? So here's the definition of impact mapping. What is impact mapping and why is this important? Um, so I guess at some point, uh, you're gonna need to do some product planning. You need to define what is the overall strategy for this product. And maybe you are using things like elevator pitch to say, well, here's the condensed uh, definition of what we're trying to accomplish or here's a product box. So there are different techniques out there that is uh, valuable. Um, now impact mapping, uh, the part of impact mapping that I really like is, is that it is visual. Uh, so we'll be able to visualize the assumptions we're making and the final scope that we're gonna be selecting. It's one of the key benefits. And the other one is that will encourage more collaboration. You're gonna have everybody looking at what we're doing. So it, this is a technique that we can use for a strategic planning and for road mapping um, to ensure alignment between the business and delivery. And, and this is very critical. It's one of the main reasons why some organizations are adopting things like Agile is to make sure that anything that we're doing on the technology side is to satisfy something on the business. So who needs to be take uh, or to be part of this process? Um, essentially anybody who has something to say about um, the product we are creating. So typically you're gonna have technical people that can inform the business about what technologies are available, how we can leverage on those technologies to produce some value, but definitely business people that will essentially get together and collaborate and to answer these four simple questions. Why are we doing this? Who can help us to reach the goal? Who can maybe block us to reach to our goal? Um, what kind of behaviors we want to, behavior change we want to produce on those actors. Um, that's the way that we want them to be able to help us. And finally, we need to identify what are the things we need to build um, so that we can support those uh, changes in behavior. That's a very simple idea. And, and I think, uh, you know, I'm surprised that it took so long to somebody to come up with this idea. Uh, so maybe there are some similar ideas out there, but this is gaining a lot of attention. So we may want to define what we mean by impact. And, and this is one of the hardest part um, that I have experienced every time I'm teaching and coaching on impact mapping is to make people understand what an impact is. It's very, very common to see people confusing impact with features. They, they keep going back to the feature and, and I need to keep asking, but why do you think you need to do this? Why do you think the business need that feature? And that's how we can get finally to get to the point of what is the benefit? Uh, so that's usually the word that I need to use in order to get them 
uh, to start thinking about uh, impacts. What is the benefit you want to produce uh, on those e users or outcomes? So um, we are talking about behavior change. So it means start doing something, stop doing something, or do something differently. And and we need to make sure that we are not confusing this with features when we start saying, well, we need to have a feature to be able to register for courses. If we are implementing a, a let's say a university um, um, program, um, we may need to avoid that. I would say, why do you like to do that? What are you going to be doing different? There is a way today to perform that behavior. What do you like to do differently? It has to be faster. It has to be more reliable what essentially we want to do. Um, so here's some examples. So we may have register for courses. That's a behavior, right? So we may have that behavior today using paper forms. Um, we want, may have something for uh, processing exceptional cases, like, oh, we have a schedule conflict, uh, fixed registration errors. That's not what we want to hear when we're asking for impact, because those are essentially things that we do typically in some way. What we want to hear is, what do you like to do differently in terms of register for courses? Well, this is something we're going to be doing differently. So if today the student, in order to register, they need to bring, oh, here's my registration uh, form, and somebody else we go and, and do the processing. And now we're saying, no, we're going to be allowing you, student, to self-register. That's a change. They will start doing things differently. You don't need to depend on somebody else anymore, unless that you have a specific, uh, I would say, restriction. Uh, and then if we like to work on, on the exceptional cases, then we're saying, well, we would like to process those exceptional cases faster. That's a change in the behavior. We want to fix registration errors faster or more reliably. Uh, so that's the, the part that we need to keep in mind when we talk about impact mapping. So as I mentioned, uh, the result of a impact mapping session, and this is something we can do in, let's say, a couple of hours, depending on the size of, of the scope that we have in mind, um, the result will be an impact map. And an impact map will essentially be a visualization of the assumptions that we're making and the scope. So all the way from the beginning, when we start saying, we would like to do this, this is our goal, and we're going to be increasing re revenue by 50% or something like that. That is an assumption. It's not something we say, well, that's that's the real uh, thing that we're going to, uh, you know, end up uh, accomplishing. So, and then we start saying, this is all the things we're going to do in order to provide that benefit, uh, all of that assumptions. And sometimes we have, um, and I would say, most of the time we have those assumptions but they are not necessarily clear they're not transparent we cannot see how do we ended up working on this feature what was the assumption we're making so if we start going from the goal say this is the goal we want to accomplish and we are assuming this is our hypothesis that this actor can help us to reach that goal and we are assuming that if we do this for that actor that is the way that this actor will help us to reach that goal. And then we say, and if we deliver this, we will be able to produce that impact on the users. All of that is assumptions. And then at the end, I have the scope. The scope will be the things that we call features or capabilities. Um, so the way we do this is, first of all, before we get into, uh, let's say, the, the actual creation of the map, we need to do some preparation. First of all, we need to have an idea of what is our goal. So no matter what approach you're using, agile or not, you need to have a vision, you need to have an idea of where you're heading, and we need to make sure we have real goals. And we're going to go in more details in a minute. Once you have those real goals, you need to have a way to say, well, how are we going to be able to measure this? We need to have a way to measure that we are accomplishing that goal. We need to know where we are today, where exactly we want to be. And, and then we need to plan what would be the first milestone. So obviously, depending on the size the, of the goal, um, it may take several milestones for you to get there. But you need to focus on what is the very next milestone that we need to reach so that we can um, use that as an opportunity to know if we're going in the right direction or not, if we're going to need to pivot or if we're getting all those benefits right away. 
And then after we do that, and let's say that we have uh, an established milestone, then we go into the mapping and here's where we're going to be doing all the visualization. You like to have an idea of what is what the uh, map will look like. So we may start putting some of those um, the, the answer to those questions, like what is the goal, who are the actors? And then we need to start finding alternatives. What if, what else can we do for this? And and finally, you're gonna be able to find key priorities. We're gonna see that the key priorities here in this model are not um, something that we're gonna do directly or immediately at the featured uh, site. We're gonna be start prioritizing impact. If we prioritize impacts, then we'll be able to identify, well, what are the features that we need to bring in and then deal with some additional dependencies, but that will essentially save a lot of time. And then you have finally earn or learn. What do we mean by that? And this is more getting into the execution. As I mentioned, uh, all the things we're doing here is visualizing assumptions, but once you start building something and delivering, we need to make sure that this outcome is either uh, making us earn what we um, uh, intended to, or we are learning from it. And as long as you're learning, that's good. And if we're doing this in a very short time frame, then you still have time to to suit, to pivot, and you're not wasting a lot of time and a lot of effort and, and money. So, how do we discover uh, real goals, or how do we get to the specific of what is the real goal? Uh, you're going to be surprised when I ask people about what is the goal of a given product or project. Um, they still very high level, very generic. It's hard for us to know what exactly does it mean in terms of the business. So this is a model that I really like. It's very simple, easy to remember. So I will say that for any uh, major initiative or project, you are trying to accomplish one of these two or three things. Um, you either want to increase revenue, you either want to avoid cost, or you want to improve service. So that will be an entry point. So we need to determine uh, which one of these is the, the one that we're trying to accomplish. In some cases it would be maybe a combination of them, but that's fine. But we are getting into something more concrete, what exactly we are trying to get. The next thing will be, and this is all due in the preparation uh, for doing impact mapping. The next thing will be, what would be the measurements that we're gonna be using uh, to, First of all, know, you know, if we're accomplishing what we are aiming at, uh, what is, uh, what would be the unit that we're gonna be using for measuring it? Um, so if we're saying faster, well, how faster? We will be able to process, um, you know, 1,000 exceptional cases uh, a day, uh, right? So that's, that's essentially one way to measure it. And you need to have a benchmark. You need to know where we are today, as this will be your current baseline. And, and this will be very valuable for us to say, well, how much progress have we made? And you may need to have a constraint to say, well, this will be kind of the break even point. Um, if we get here, it's not okay, but then you need to have what is your desired outcome? Um, what will be the final uh, goal that you have? This is one way to do it. This is uh, from Tom Gilb's uh, work on, on competitive engineering, uh, so giving, uh, maybe you're familiar with this, you have seen this um, when you specify requirements that you want to get to the specific. So we have those good measurements. So here's an, an example of an impact map. Let's say that we uh, did all that work and we identify a milestone and we want to implement this um, course registration system that, you know, for some reason this school doesn't have right now. And uh, so they're doing a lot of manual processing and here's the goal, they want to reduce uh, student registration costs by uh, X, by 15%. And uh, they have identified the people and the, why they would like to reduce costs because right now they, they're spending a lot of paper and they have a lot of people that need to be there processing the student registration. So that uh, is a big deal. So they understand that uh, with the student, they can get closer to reaching that goal by allowing the student to self-register. This is the thing that we want the student to do differently. And finally, you have the things that potentially uh, will allow the student to have that impact. They will be able to self-register. So they will be able to register for courses online. They will be able to browse the catalog. They will be able to receive course recommendations online so they don't need to 
go and talk to somebody, have something printed on paper, and then you have some other uh, impact that we like to have on the student. They want to the student to be able to fix their own registration error, so there will be maybe something like, well, we can uh, have some validation built in into the product and so on and so forth. Just to give you an idea of how we go and do this. Now, in real life, this is kind of looking good and you may be wondering, well, what software you use for this? Um, so for uh, presentation purposes, I use uh, essentially any impact mapping, sorry, any uh, mind mapping tool will, will essentially help you with this. Uh, but in real life, we want to take people away from the the keyboards and focus on the work. So we typically use post-its and we start basically writing and putting it on the wall and having everybody talking about it. Um, and then um, have more people adding more impacts they want to produce um, until we get consensus. Obviously, all of this need to be time boxed because if not, we're gonna spend you know um, days and days just trying to be too perfect. Now, um, at some point, we're going to need to pick something. Let's say that we have this goal, but we're thinking, well, we are not sure that we'll be able to deliver everything, depending on what is the, the constraint we have. If we like to have, uh, let's say, in this case, for registration, uh, course registration, I guess there will be something we need to have ready by the time registration will be open. So you may have a restriction on time, so you're going to need to select what you can do at that point. Um, this will be critical for uh, by the time we're going to be planning releases. So the first thing we should do to prioritize instead of going immediately to the solution space is to focus on outcomes. These are the outcomes. What are the outcomes that we want to produce first? And by looking at that, you'll be able to carry all the features that are associated with those outcomes. So you go from here and you're going to see well, these are the product capabilities. Let's say that this is what we'll be able to do, um, or we think we'll be able to do. So at this point, we we are not necessarily envisioning a particular uh, time frame. It's not a commitment or anything like that. It's just basically saying, it seems like this could be. Uh, chances are that things will change. We'll discover new things or maybe modify some of these capabilities that we are envisioning here. So from here, and, and this is where we're going to start connecting the dots and saying, well, what can I do with that impact map? Well, that last level of your impact map is your high-level product backlog. This is the things you're going to be placing in your backlog. I'm using the word high-level. Um, just trying to avoid all the terminology um, uh, that is out there is so, so overloaded. Um, so I like to use, let's say, capabilities, where you may want to call it epics or features. Anyway, so this is the biggest um, size on that backlog, the biggest um, uh, size of these items in a backlog. Um, so this is what we have. When we have a backlog, is still not a commitment. It's still a bunch of things that we feel we may want to eventually deliver on. So the next step will be, uh, planning releases. But before we get there, you may want to validate each one of those items in the in the product backlogs. You may want to say, well, what is, give me a brief description of what it is. Tell me what is the value we provide. So you may say, tell me what is the um, hypothesis for the benefit that this uh, uh, feature or, uh, or capability will provide. Um, but also you can use the user story format and you can see how straightforward you can go from impact maps to this user story format. So we have actor, we have impact that are essentially benefits and we have deliverers. This is the what. So if we like to write this in the user story format, we have as an actor, as a student, right? I want to what essentially they want and this is the deliverable. And then they need to explain in order to, and that would be the impact, that would be the benefit. So now we can expand, say, well, what exactly this impact will do for the student? It will say time, money, associated with printing, and all, so on and so forth. It doesn't have to be uh, described this way, but um, just because we're going to be getting into um, story mapping and talking about user stories, so it could be a good way to think about these big capabilities. And not always they will be big. Some cases, depending on 
your context, we may be look, looking at, well, we can produce this impact with this little feature. And that would be even better because that means you don't need to spend too much time planning. So um, up to this point, I guess you are, um, I would say, have a good understanding of what an impact map is. So essentially it's four questions, four levels, the why, the who, how we can impact that user, and then finally the what. And uh, some of the key benefits or key advantages of using this approach compared to other approaches is, first of all, it's very simple. So you don't need to learn um, a lot of it, like a new, new syntax or you know, have boxes and arrows that means different things depending on how you draw them. Um, it is visual, so that's another key point. And so everybody can come and see so it promotes transparency. And finally, it's collaborative. So you may have everybody coming together. If we're doing this in a in a session with a big wall, everybody will be able to contribute and, and get the benefit out of it. And this will be a good way for us to reach consensus, not just to have a vision, but have a, a vision with consensus in which everybody understands this is the goal we're going to be addressing. You may have even more than one goal, depending on um, your your capacity, um, but we're making sure that we are not missing anything, that other goals are still good, they may remain there for, for the future, and then we can go from there and get into more, I would say, tactical planning. And this is where we're gonna be now talking about uh, delivering outcomes. So we're gonna take the result of this impact map and then define what will be our tactical approach to deliver on those promises for those impacts or outcomes. So we may want to say that this is sort of release planning, um, even though you may not necessarily call it release, but it's a milestone, whatever that is, because sometimes we're doing this just to do an experiment and get feedback, and you may not call it a release. But in any case, when we have this situation, this is where we're going to start introducing constraints. Up to this point has been all about, this is something could potentially deliver, but now we need to deal with constraint. Typically we need to deal with the iron triangle. What is what is the the, the corner that we have some flexibility on? Is, is, is time, is scope? So we need to have a way to answer questions like what will be delivered, how long it's gonna take, um, how much it's gonna cost, depending on what we, uh, what constraints we have. So now we're going to be introducing the story mapping. So uh, the problem with the high level product backlog is that by the time we get it to this point, it will be too big. So the items that we have in the backlog are uh, too big to be considered um, something that we can use to execution. For execution, we need to have something that is more actionable. So we're going to need to take those capabilities and start breaking in into uh, little chunks that we can use for planning and for execution, let's say in, in the springs and whatever approach you have. So you're gonna need to break it down. Now, the problem we have seen is that if you don't have a way to visualize that decomposition, you may end up with obviously a linear backlog that is gonna start growing because we're breaking bigger pieces into a smaller ones, but then you're gonna start missing the big picture. You're gonna start losing what are the things that we need to deliver? So uh, a story mapping will help you to do both things, to decompose and at the same time to visualize that decomposition and it will help you to make better decisions about what we can deliver or how long it's gonna take. So essentially we take the same uh, user-centric approach. As you can see, we start with the user on the top and then we have the capability. Where this capability came from? From our impact map. That's the last part of your impact map. You're taking that capability and bringing it here and say, now we would like to get into more details about what do we need to do exactly to provide a capability. In many cases, especially when we're dealing with, um, I would say user-centric scenarios, the user needs to do certain things in order to get that capability. Uh, we may call these steps in the workflow. You may call it themes, these are more generic or you may call it user task. Um, but essentially, this is a very high level abstraction of the things they need to do. It's still, I would say, technology agnostic. It's, it's try to stay at, at, at the level that we can use it to have conversation with the business, with the user itself, without introducing too much, I would say, of our technical language. 
Uh, so this will tell the whole story. And in this case, I'll be assuming uh, this scenario of a, uh, we'll say a workflow. So we're gonna have a bunch of steps. Now, uh, the next thing we're gonna do here is when we start breaking it down, we have these steps. Now we're gonna need to identify smaller pieces. Here we're gonna be identifying user stories. For that user, what do we need to do? Something more specific, something uh, we'll say more granular that we can use for planning and for execution. When we start breaking that capability into stories, uh, we may want to start basically identifying what are the things that we will do first. If we have the time, what will be the first, the very first thing we'll do? So you start placing the story vertically in terms of necessity or priority order. And all of this is being done the same way, looking on the wall, having all the people involved. At this point, you'd like to have more of the technical team involved because they will have a lot to say about how to decompose this capabilities into smaller pieces. And also they will have a lot to say about dependencies, technical dependencies that maybe the business is um, unaware of. So the other uh, concept that we wanna introduce here is the walking skeleton. So if we like to have, let's say a very good tactical approach to deliver the value that this capability want to provide, we want to make sure that we're going to get there as soon as possible. Um, so given that we have this grid, uh, some people may say, what about going vertically? Do a step one completely with all the options in step one, or then do step two, and then do step three. That could be an approach. All right. But this one will be better if we like to validate this capability because the thing we're going to do here is say tell me what is the simplest story that can satisfy that step somehow and it will be not necessarily not always will be something that we can even release but is going end to end right from the beginning so you'll be able to start seeing this you'll be able to even plan test end to end if you take this approach instead of using this one and what happens if you run out of time? If you do the walking skeleton and then do something else, you still will have a way to say, well, we have a solution. We have a way to provide a capability. But if you have been doing this step by step and you run out of time, out of money, you're going to have, let's say, two or three steps that are perfectly implemented, but you cannot satisfy the overall workflow. So that's definitely critical. The walking skeleton is a very good idea for us to make sure that we Right from the beginning, we have a strategy to deliver. So here's an example for the same student registration system. So we have the student register for courses, that's the capability. And these are the things that the student need to do. You may ignore all the things that we have underneath, but typically if you think about um, self-registering for courses, you need to log in, you need to select classes, you need to review, you need to enroll. You may have different, way how to, different ways how to um, you know, I will say, see this workflow. You may have um, another steps here and we'll say browse the catalog, then select, then review, then enroll. That's all fine. And you may discover that during this process, if you start feeling like, oh, this story doesn't belong here, it's belong to a previous step, then you can definitely start identifying those steps and moving the stories. So uh, here I have all the stories associated with those steps on the top. And if you can see here in the top, this will be my walk-in skeleton. Um, so what I'm saying here, you'll be able to sign on, you'll be able to select recommended courses, and you'll be able to see the current schedule, you'll be able to submit your current selection. So what this thing is doing, uh, so essentially what this uh, workflow, what this walk-in skeleton is doing is enabling the student to register for recommended courses only. So imagine that this is an advisor recommending courses online uh, for this student, and this is the only thing they will do in the walk-in skeleton. So what are we gaining here is that in order for us to implement a very simple walk-in skeleton, we need to have sufficient infrastructure that we can use to keep building on top of it. Um, so, and this will give you something that we can go and see about. They will be able to see current schedule. There will be some validation that we need to do for during the submission. So you're gonna have something end to end say, well, we have registered for courses, but if we talk about this simple, um, I would say slice is only providing register for recommended courses, which is a great way to make progress. Um, so 
but we are not still selecting. We're just basically having some idea that what could be the first thing we'll do. So the benefits of, in, of a story mapping is that it will help you to visualize and organize, clarify your scope. In this case, now that we're dealing with constraints, you would like to make sure you have a clear picture of what it is. Also will help you to identify missing, duplicate or inconsistent stories. And also it will help you to uncover technical dependencies because now you'll be able to see the whole thing. You'll be able to have um, a clear picture of where the stories are and which one need to be, you know, move on top of the others because they have dependencies. So as I mentioned, this is how you go from impact mapping to story mapping. And this is why I like these two uh, techniques so much is because they are have very simple things um, in terms of visualization, in terms of how collaborative they are, but they work really well together. So we have actors that we have already done some work identifying so we don't need to spend more time on that. So we can leverage on the work we have done uh, during impact mapping. And we have already identified high level deliverables of capabilities that we can bring in. And we're just basically gaining more understanding about how we're gonna deliver that capability on a given time frame. Now, we still haven't answered this question. What will be delivered? How long is gonna take? So right now we just have a visual representation. Now we need to deal with constraints. So here's where we're going to be looking at this backlog. This is your backlog. It's not a linear backlog. It's more like, I would say, a bidimensional backlog. Uh, here's where we start estimating the work and having an idea, well, how big this is. And uh, the very common techniques that we use for this is um, story pointing. So we're going to be story pointing all these stories here in this particular um, scope. And then we're going to have an idea, well, how big it is. Knowing how big it is, is still is not uh, something that we can use to answer the question. We need to start forecasting. We need to start um, forecasting, let's say, well, uh, at what pace the team will be able to deliver this uh, overall scope. In other words, we need to forecast something like velocity or any other way that you're going to be using for measuring um, a progress. So let's say that we have this and uh, we have done some estimation you may ask the team, well, think about the stories we have here. How many you think you can deliver in one sprint? How many points are in a sprint? In, in, in those um, stories that we're selecting. You can do this in different ways. There are some light ways or others that will be more, I would say, heavier. Um, but one simple thing you could try is to basically sampling. Take a group of stories that you think you can deliver in one sprint. Take another group and keep comparing how many points is that. That will give you an idea of what could be the potential velocity for that team. Obviously, this is not a number that you can use and say, well, this will be definitely the number of points that we're going to deliver. And you don't want to even average that number. You just want to come up with something you feel it makes sense, is something that we feel reliable that we can deliver. But we would like to put a range around that estimate. So if we let's say that this team decided to, or after doing that, they determine they could do roughly 10 points. So roughly 10 points could be, well, you can go from eight to 13, depending on how much uncertainty you, can, you have. You may say, this is a reasonable range going from eight to 13. And let's say that we have a time constraint. We're saying, well, we only have eight sprints. Um, we cannot bring more uh, work um, that we cannot fit into eight sprint. So now we have a, I would say a, a plan that will say, well, we can deliver between 64 points and how many other points? 104 points. So, so that will be sort of our our um, target here. This is where we're going to be landing, uh, hopefully. Still not uh, something that we can commit on. It's something that we can say, well, this is uh, potentially what's going to happen. Once it starts printing, then you're going to know better um, where you're going to be landing. Now, the thing is, now we need to make a selection. Let's say that this is the forecast. We haven't selected the scope. We only have an idea of our capacity, how much we can deliver in that particular time frame. Usually, you will have things like, well, there is an MVP. There is a minimum viable product. We cannot release less than that. And we need to make sure that we have a clear selection in your uh, story map. But now we can draw these lines, and you can use this. Um, you can do this if you have this on, on the wall uh, using stickies. You can use tape to draw the line uh, of what the team will have, what 
will be the things that we will deliver, assuming the lowest potential velocity. So who's making this selection? Product people, product owner, product management. They will need to say, well, given that we can do 64 points, what would you select with those 64 points? And here's where you can have a very good conversation about, you know, what could be possible. And what we have in here is a plan for even the worst case scenario. Using the lowest potential velocity, we still have a plan. And you may have somebody saying, you know what, I definitely would like to have this story right here to be part of the, I would say, the will have plan. And then we'll say, well, but we don't have room for it. So we're going to need to identify something that we can drop. Or they may say, is there a way that we can, let's say, split this big story, the eight point story, so that we can fit this one in and have maybe uh, part of this one implemented? So that could be definitely a good thing to do. Uh, at this point, it's a good, I would say, strategy um, to have a plan that we can use for the worst case scenario. And then you have the might have plan, which is um, essentially what potentially could happen assuming the best potential velocity. And then you have the other part say, well, you will not have this part because even in the worst, in the best case scenario, you will not be able to deliver. All right. So key points about these two techniques. Uh, first of all, impact mapping, we can use this for strategic planning and it will help you to focus. It will help you to eliminate waste um, of, you know, related to extra features. So we're going to be looking at what are the impacts that we want to produce. And from there, we're going to be selecting what we want to uh, deliver. And next, we can go from those impact maps and get into uh, story maps. And here's where you can um, define a tactical plan to deliver on those promises or those assumptions that you have on your impact map. And both of these techniques are uh, very simple. They are visual and they are collaborative. You can use them using low tech, uh, post-its and Sharpies. You, if you like to use tools, there are tools available that you can use uh, for, uh, let's say, visualizing this and on 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 a software or sharing. But uh, I think uh, the best way to work is to have everybody together having all of this uh, conversation and gaining this shared understanding and getting everybody on board of what we want to accomplish. So if you'd like to know a little bit more about this, uh, so these are the two uh, books uh, that I'm basically using for this talk and, and these are the go-to reference on these two topics, impact mapping uh, and user story mapping. And you have it there, um, make sure you read them and you're gonna get even more insights that you can get in 45 minutes, all right? So this is it for me. I um, appreciate your time and I think we have time for some questions. So I'll go over some of your questions and I will, I will try to answer as many as, as I can. Um, if for some reason I cannot answer your question, um, I will try to follow up uh, via email. All right, so we have uh, one question here. Um, what do you do, for example, in the case of a student registration when the actor isn't benefiting from the new capability. The purpose is for the school to reduce cost. It's a very good question. Um, and this could be one of the things that people may feel, well, you know, it's not always about the user. There would be certain things about the business. So um, using this technique, you know, eventually you may want to find who is going to be benefiting for that. It, the, the business itself is, is avoiding uh, cost, but they could be also some benefit for the student. Um, we didn't talk about it, but I guess the student will be um, happier doing the registration this way because they don't need to wait in line. They don't need to, you know, to be up early in the morning to make sure that they will get into a particular class. Um, they will be able to easily fix a registration error. So I would say my first, um, my first strategy would be to try to find who is going to be benefiting uh, from that particular impact beyond the business. And if we cannot find something is just the business, then you may say that we're going to have sort of a uh, fake actor that is the business. Um, but at the end of the day, we definitely, we just want to make sure we have shared understanding of what we're doing and how we're going to be delivering on that. All right. So another question is, after visualizing and ordering the release backlog using the story mapping, 
how do you use a story map throughout a project? It's a very good question. Um, so you can actually live your story map uh, on the wall if you like, um, assuming that you are co-located. So you can use that for saying, well, this will be our backlog and you can track progress by every story you have implemented, you can put a check mark on them. Um, other teams are typically what they're gonna do is to <clears throat> take um, that result and put it into their backlog and order the backlog accordingly. Um, so, so whatever is, is I would say less wasteful is, is the way to go. Um, but I think the main benefit of it is the whole um, journey to get to have shared understanding and gaining that shared understanding. Uh, another question, could you apply any of these techniques halfway into the project? Yes, definitely. I've seen this. I've been, um, in some cases, teaching a different class, like maybe, you know, release planning or um, requirements, uh, either requirements. And and then the, the students will be kind of telling what they are working on. And I will ask the question, have you asked why you're doing that? And, and they will be, you know, lost. They will say, I don't know. I was told to do it. And uh, sometimes they will say, well, let's do an exercise. Let's do, um, let's start to create the impact map in reverse order. So we're working on this, what exactly we're trying to get. And they will be surprised to, to realize that well, we shouldn't be working on this. So we could have been working on something different. Same thing with the story mapping. When you, um, let's say at some point you look at something that is coming to your team and is, um, you know, more complex than you anticipated, and you would like to have some conversation about how are you going to slice the work? So in that case, it would be, okay, here's the single capability. We're going to go and slice the work and have some conversation about uh, what would be the potential walking skeleton and so on and so forth, have an idea how big it's going to be. So that's definitely something you can do and use this tool. But in most cases, you see it applied like more in a top-down approach. Um, but it's definitely valuable to also look back depending on what we're doing today. All right. Um, another question is, how can you use these approaches within a scale agile frameworks uh, like SAVE? Um, well, SAVE scale agile frameworks for, if you're not familiar with it, is one of um, several approaches available for doing uh, agile software development at scale. In other words, when you have five to 12 teams working together toward the same goal, and you need to do some planning together, you need to do execution together, and do all those things. So uh, in SAFE, there are um, some events in which we can leverage these techniques. So the first part is uh, before planning, what they call a program increment. A program increment is, let's say, a time box. It can go from eight weeks to 12 weeks in which, um, a group of teams that they call it a release train. So you may say that we have 10 teams that we're gonna be working on the same program. So before they plan those eight to 12 weeks, they need to do some, I would say discovery of what they're gonna be working on. So that's where you can use impact mapping to say what are the impacts we want to produce in the next increment. And uh, one of the things we need to produce out of that preparation process is, let's say, a top 10 list of what are the features we're going to be looking at for the next increment. And that's something that can come, to, you know, will come directly from the impact mapping exercise. Those are the features we're going to be selecting to produce those impacts. Now, when you get to the PI planning uh, event, and this is a big, I would say, uh, room planning event in which you have all the teams um, working on the capabilities they're gonna be working on and they need to do all the work that I explained here, breaking it down, estimating, deciding how much they can uh, take for that particular time frame, so they can take those capabilities and do the story mapping and knowing that they will have eight to 12, depending on what is the cadence they have selected for the PI planning. So they can go ahead and do the planning, similar to the example that I show you. Um, if you're assuming that we have eight sprints, then we can, um, not eight sprint, I will say eight weeks, um, we're going to need to select what could deliver. And you're going to have your product owner there can make decisions about what will be um, they will have line, where do be the might have line. So definitely they fit well together as long as you're willing to embrace new ideas because 
uh, safe, for example, it could be a little bit prescriptive and they have particular ways how to do things, but I think you can definitely get a lot of benefit out of this. I have done this with some of the teams that I have coached using safe on PI planning. Um, okay, so I think I have time for answer one more question. And this is how do you ensure this your understanding doesn't get lost during execution? Any recommended approaches? to ensure traceability. Um, yes, definitely. There are some other techniques and, and practices that we can connect with this. So if you notice, we're going all the way from a user or let's say a business goal and we're using a user-centric approach identifying what is the impact that we want to produce on them, uh, what are the things we're going to be selecting. Now we get into execution. How do we make sure that what we're taking on every sprint is satisfying um, those assumptions or uh, validating those assumptions that we made before. So here you can use things like behavior-driven development. So behavior-driven development, as the name implies, is focused on behavior. Maybe not the same way that we explain in um, impact mapping, but essentially behavior is something that we want to deliver to the user, and we want to make sure that we can use specific examples to deliver on, on those capabilities. So you can go all the way from here, identifying acceptance criteria, executing, and making sure you're delivering on those behaviors and you can use that to validate. Here you can take advantage of the walking skeleton and going across, try to have vertical slices that will go across the capability. And you can use behavior-driven development to make sure you have tests and you have executable specification that you can use all the way to uh, make sure you're delivering your promises. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, attending the conference. Uh, thank you so much for spending this time with me, being a Friday, right? Um, so I really appreciate it. I appreciate your feedback. Um, so I hope that you have found this class, this uh, session really valuable and and um, I'm looking forward to hear from you that you're applying this and getting all the benefit. Uh, so it's time for maybe it's a beer time or whiskey time. It's given this is a Friday. So I hope you have enjoyed the conference and hope to see you later.